is uh, Mordecai Greenberg, and I am with Canada-Palestine Support Network, which is the co-sponsor of this meeting, along with the Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights, SPHR chapter at uh, UBC. And this is part of uh, the uh, Israeli Apartheid Week, which is being held in campuses across Canada and in several other countries. As an introduction, I only want to make uh, one comment. I think we are at a cusp, a turning point, in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. For all the horrors inflicted on the people of Gaza in January, December and January by the Israeli military, the corresponding event which is really remarkable is the mushrooming explosion around the world of support for Palestinians as I would say in my awareness as never before. Today I was on the internet and there was a demonstration of thousands of people in Malmo, Sweden. And Malmo was hosting the uh, uh, um, tennis match between Israel and Sweden. And the organizers of the match, which was being held in a large stadium, decided as a result of the anger and protest of the Swedish people in the streets, that they would restrict entrance to this large stadium to a select group of 300 people. And the Israeli uh, tennis uh, star, was absolutely appalled. He said it's like when playing a practice match. It had lost all its glitter and importance. That's a, that's a small example of uh, the kind of anger that has arisen at Israeli atrocities. And I think the responsibility for us is now to organize with this change of popular awareness an effective and sustained campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions which can bring about real fundamental change. The opportunity is ours, the responsibility is ours, and let's wish all of us success in this endeavor. I'd now like to introduce Mohammed Balan, uh, from uh, Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights at UBC. This week, we have been participating in International Israeli Apartheid Week, and this has caused a lot of controversy on campus due to the inconvenient truth that Israel is indeed an apartheid state. We drew chalk graffiti on the walls of a student union building and had, se and had several events throughout the week. In one of the anonymously issued pamphlets that attempted to discredit our efforts, it was stated that the charge that Israel is an apartheid state shamefully diminishes and exploits the just struggle against, self, against the injustices of South African apartheid. SBHR didn't have far to look in order to disprove this accusation or even attempt to show its absurdity, being that today we have the honor and the privilege to introduce one of the leaders who was at, who was at the forefront of the struggle against South African apartheid, a Jewish South African who I'm sure will do a better job than myself to explain exactly how South Africans feel about Israeli apartheid and whether or not it is an insult to South African, to the South African struggle to identify Israeli policies as such. The highest serving Jewish South African in a democratic government of South Africa is the courageous Rony Castros. He brings to the floor a personal experience of intelligence and security acquired through the many years he served in the African National Congress, Congress's clandestine structure, structures. It was the Sharpeville Massacre of 1960 that inspired Castros to join the African National Congress that he eventually became a part of. Ronnie Castro's has passionately espoused the cause of the Palestinian people for justice and national self-determination and believes this is the only way to secure peace and security for both Israeli and Palestinian peoples. 
He believes that as a South African of Jewish origin, he has a moral obligation to speak out against Israel's unacceptable policies and has founded a South African solidarity group called Not In My Name. And with no further delay, please join me in a warm round of applause for the extraordinary and inspirational Ronnie Castries. Good evening everybody and thanks so much to Mordecai and to Mohammed. It's very, very good to be here in Canada um, for all those many, many years. Uh, the people of Can Canada stood by us, supported us. It was extremely meaningful from far off South Africa, whether one was in the prisons or whether one was in the underground, whether one was in exile. Uh, we were very well aware of every single event of support that was taking place. And Mordechai's point today about uh, uh, Malmo and the tennis match there, you can imagine the impact that is making uh, in terms of the Palestinian people's struggle. And in fact, the impact it will make on Jews in Israel who are confused and who are not that aware as they should be that the government uh, is, is a government that like apartheid in the revulsion of the international community and decent pe speaking people, decent thinking people everywhere. I've been rather amused coming here at uh, some of the propaganda utilized against the organizers of this Israel Apartheid Week um, from the extent of saying that this is a disservice to the people of South Africa and cheapens our struggle to uh, some of these other characters like your Minister of Immigration, Mr. Jason Kerry, and the principal of um, Toronto University who seem to still be living, Mordecai, in a time warp in which any, any semblance of criticism of Israel is immediately equated with anti-Semitism or any criticism of Zionism is equated with anti-Semitism. This is passé. This is part of the cusp now, the turning point that Mordechai has referred to because for many, many years Post-1948, for the obvious reasons of sympathy with the Holocaust, but also um, the extent to which Israel and the Zionist lobby was able to manipulate public opinion and the media, but particularly because the Western powers Initially, Britain as a key power, back to Balfour Declaration and Churchill's famous or infamous statement when he was saying that Britain wanted to bring about a, a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Uh, his statement uh, was, as you, I'm sure you know, well-read people here, um, that what is good for the Jewish people, meaning the Zionists, what is good for the Jewish people is good for the British Empire. Um, Brit uh, America inherited that mantle. And uh, I'm not going to go in here tonight because it's a subject of a lecture on its own. It's a subject of an of, of a entire uh, series of lectures. The role of Western capital, Western imperialism, and particularly the United States in using Israel as a client functional state of American policy. And the Zionists do discredit to the Jewish people there and everywhere else by having lent themselves so assiduously to this project because of course they believe uh, a project of this kind, the, the, the war on terror etc um, is going to give them the, uh, the, the extra time to survive and they'll play that to the hilt. But we also this week everywhere have been considering the comparisons between apartheid South Africa and apartheid Israel. And is this just a propaganda 
uh, exercise? Is this a way to help uh, the anti-Zionist, anti-Israeli forces to, to mobilize public opinion? Um, if that was the case, I, it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. But it's more than that. And I say there's nothing wrong with that, that because throughout history people were constantly making comparisons between one colonial power and another, one form of rule of repression and another, uh, fascist occupations in, in uh, Nazi Europe and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. And it, it's absolute poppycock to say that it denigrates and undermines the South African struggle if we say that the way Israel is behaving is just like uh, apartheid. Now, I'm going to play something of um, a quiz master here. I've got a question. I've got a quote. And I want to see if anybody here can get the uh, person's name who made this quote, because it's very relevant. It was made in 1960, so we're talking about nearly 50 years ago. And a South African said that Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. C can you hear me? My voice carrying. Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. It was made in November 1960. Does anybody here like to uh, suggest who might have made that statement? Fair word. Fair word. Yeah, but you've read all the stuff already and you've read my speech. <laughs> how, how, many, how many of you here would have thought, uh, in fact, I've been on a tour now in Britain, SOAS, School of Oriental African Studies, Oxford, I've come here to Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, and uh, nobody was able uh, to, to indicate that it was the, um, the architect of apartheid, none other than Dr. Hendrik Vervoort, who had studied and got his degree in the early 30s in Germany, and a Germany uh, which was obviously before 1933 already being infected by the uh, race doctrines, and that was the university he had gone to. So Vervoort um, makes that statement all those years ago. He did indeed know what he was talking about. He might not be on our side, and I can assure you he wouldn't have been. So, in terms of, of what I was saying, certainly every single successor of the Wurz, uh, it was Balthazar Johannes Forster after him, uh, he was actually such a Nazi sympathizer that during the Second World War he was interred by Smuts's government in South Africa. And then after him was this infamous P.W. Boerta. Uh, they had the most uh, um, warm and close relations with Israel. Uh, and this development had taken place in a similar context to the way Israel finds it, its support internationally. Um, after the 1973 October War, when Egypt managed to regain the Suez Canal, South Africa rushed to Israel's assistance. Of course, America was, was the, the main supplier, but they needed anything that they could lay hands on, and especially small arms. There were big orders coming out of America. Um, so this then developed into the apartheid axis of Tel Aviv and indeed Pretoria and lasted until the late 80s with the demise of, of apartheid. But I just want to analyze a little bit for, for you here the similarities. What Dr. Favut, I'm actually putting myself in his mind, which isn't a difficult thing to do with people like that. Um, Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state, and he's never been to Israel. And one doesn't have to be there. You don't have to actually be in a particular country to form an opinion on the basis of its behavior and its doctrine and policies, do you? Um, 
So for him, it was the simplest, simplest comparison. And that was racial exclusivity, race purity. Just as Israel, for all the liberal um, facade and democratic facade, as everyone knows, Israel only gives citizenship to Jews and the right of return. Well, this was a wonderful thing for Favut because he was developing the policy of apartheid which only gave citizenship to white South Africans. And if you were of indigenous African origin, the black people, or mixed race, or people out of Asia, there's a big population, you did not have uh, the right of citizenship. Now, we needn't spend too much time pointing out what the right of citizenship means. But uh, clearly, in South Africa and in Israel, it meant that you didn't have the property rights, you didn't have the trading rights, you didn't have the right to live where you wished. You couldn't even in both cases join the military security structures which are so dominant in both those countries <coughs> and which opened up the prospects of um, greater access to very special health services, even education, uh, and particularly the pension issue. I'm sure you're all aware of the nature of life for those Palestinians who live in Israel, the 20%, the so-called 1948 Palestinians. Um, they, can't, they can't develop their property, their own homes. They can't even build up. What happens when um, their offspring need to get married? They, they, they have access to 2% of land in Israel for, for uh, building. Um, the all-important area of municipal services, and you will know this from the struggle of the Republicans in Northern Ireland with the Catholic population there, how they were discriminated against in terms of the superior um, access of Protestants to municipal services. Even in terms of the infamous marriage laws of South Africa, Israel too denies a person the right of marriage in their law if you want as a Jew or a Jewess to marry an Arab or vice versa. So one can go on and on with this list and there have been a huge number of, of works in this regard. Note as well our date, 1960. Israel like South Africa is an apartheid state. Um, this is before the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza in 1967. Now, I thought it was very a, a good development that uh, Jimmy Carter uh, called Israel an apartheid state. He was referring to the occupied territories. Um, he should have actually looked more closely into Israel's society and he would have discovered that in fact the apartheid anal analogy is within Israel itself. Now, the post-67 situation, of course, brings into comparison uh, the Bantustan policy and everything that that entails. So that for Favut, since black people were not going to be given citizenship in white South Africa, they were going to be allowed to have their own citizenship in 13% of South Africa, known as the reserves. Something that South Africa as a, a colonial country 
shared with Canada and learnt from Canada, the reserve system here, and that goes way before apartheid, of course, uh, and their tremendous analogies. In fact, the question of the Bantustans in South Africa was that at least you were talking about something that was well defined with well defined boundaries in that 13%, something like nine Bantustans. I mean, horrendous places, miles and miles, hundreds of miles away from uh, the wealth of the country and the infrastructure and the, the main centres. But I said to President Arafat Mohammed when I visited him in 2004 with the South African delegation, we had travelled around the occupied territories and then we came to the Mukata in Ramallah, his headquarters which was uh, almost uh, pulverised in 2002 when they, the Israeli Defence Force went in uh, on that occasion. And uh, Arafat said to us, <coughs> Well, you now see the conditions under which our people live. It's just like a Bantustan, isn't it? And uh, I waited for a moment and I said, Well, Mr. President, I disagree with you. It's not just like a Bantustan. So there was a bit of shocked silence. He could have heard a pin drop. And I said, You see, President Arafat, it's far worse. Everybody was hanging on to every word. And I said, in our Bantustans, you travel towards them. The only signs that you were coming to the Bantustan was that the very good road system was running out from the, the, the macadamized road system into gravel, inferior gravel, and the terrain was becoming rather bleak. If you looked very carefully, you might just glimpse the sign on the side of the road saying you are now entering the uh, um, Transkei or Vendor or whatever. Mr. President, there are no walls, apartheid walls, around the Bantustans. There were not even continuous barbed wire fences. And it was only when there was tension in the land, and of course at times there were operations within Abantistan and so on, that you would find a police contingent or the military contingent at that crossing point. But you see, Mr. President, there was never one occasion in the whole history of South Africa that the South African Defence Force sent in their tanks or their warplanes to bomb and rocket the people within those Bantustans. And by the way, they did very cruel things and we had people massacred from time to time, as you well know. It was an obnoxious system. Um, but in fact, there were very few instances in the townships now, like Soweto, Cato Manor, Durban, uh, District 6 in Cape Town, Kailicha, these big, big African townships, um, where at times of, of, of the people resorting to strike action um, and demonstrations and the like, it would be in that period that there would be a uh, encirclement of the township and they would have the checkpoints and they would go in with the military or the police house to house looking for people. But this would never last more than a couple of weeks or so. I'm not belittling what our people had to face. I've said it, it was horrendous and the world came to see it and to stand by us. But just as Archbishop Desmond Tutu stated when he went to Israel in the late 1990s, went into Palestine, and he said that what the Palestinians are going through makes what we lived through child's play by comparison. It wasn't child's play, but get the gist of, of the rhetoric there. People so shocked, South Africans so shocked 
at what we saw and what you see on the television sets and so on over all these years that every South African has said these are people from the freedom struggle everyone will say this is far worse than what we encountered so I, I would submit that clearly to use the analogy is a, a very helpful one but you know this question of ideology brings it home even more because you had the apartheid system and its its legal system and its laws all based on as I mentioned earlier on the the race purity issue because that's what what uh, the, the, the question of Israel only for Jews is about. And what you find in this analogy is what you well know here from Canada's experience uh, and dispossession of the Native American people here or in the United States or what befell the Aboriginal peoples of Australasia. And that was, firstly, that the colonizers who came to South Africa, Dutch and then British, in their different ways talked about the civilizing mission, to come to the heathen and to bring civilization to them. Obviously, their, their rationale and justification for setting up the colonial system. But um, the homegrown Afrikaner settlers took this much further as they trekked as pioneers into the interior of the country because they weren't happy with British rule in the Cape and they spoke in those biblical terms, those very same biblical terms chosen people covenant with the Lord to deliver our enemies into our hands Bible and gun and the dispossession process together with the dispossession that the, the British and the, the Dutch had been involved in. And this is why when we wash away the cobwebs from that Holocaust era which was very cleverly followed through from 48, it's really not difficult comrades, friends, ladies and gentlemen to see that Israel is a racist colonial settler state. And that's what the analogy with apartheid is all about. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's not that we are simply invoking apartheid um, to build up hatred against Israel and its citizens. It's a question of being able to characterize a system correctly because if we don't then you make all sorts of errors and there have been huge errors made in terms of the Palestinians right to land to return of refugees to their rights and their dignity I've seen this myself with my own government and my own party the ANC the moment one accepted the uh, paradigm that Israel and its supporters had managed to put across that uh, this is about two people both with justice on, on their side and both with, with just objectives and that um, the struggle of the Jewish Zionist people that created the state of Israel was as a war of national liberation that the moment you and analyze then what the state is about it's very very clear that what we've come to see in the 20th and now well into the 21st century that what had befallen indigenous native peoples of North and South America of, of Africa, Asia, Australasia is a project which was brought into existence by the Zionist movement at the end of the 19th century and because of, of, of particular circumstances 
put into effect implemented with the 1948 Declaration of Independence. From that point of view, we're perfectly correct to make the analogy and to help with the strategizing. Because if you're going to, and you do need to argue with your government here, and with opinion makers in this society, in this country, and with those of the Jewish community who genuinely believe they're being wronged, that one needs to be able to identify and characterize as people like Mordecai and other veterans around the world from a Jewish background have been doing because this was a small group that had been stronger in the past at the end of the 19th century the Zionist ethnic nationalists of Eastern Europe and the Russian Empire turned away from the idea of common cause with the working people and the other suffering minority groups of the Russian Empire and said out of Zionism that um, the whole world and the whole history is always against the Jews so we must be on our own, it's got to be exclusive. But they had it tough. In the first place the rabbis did not accept their uh, arguments. And I'm not going to go into that, but it's all got to do with the, the, the fundamentalist view of, of the Bible um, and, and the teachings thereof. They've changed now. But within Jewish communities around the world, which were socialist imbued, you had a tremendous basis to uh, debate and refute the Zionist argument. And we must remember that in our discussions and arguments with the Zionist groups because they don't know their own history, they don't care to, to know it. It's hidden purposely because the truth, the truth actually explains the, the just case, the just cause, the legitimacy of the Palestinian struggle. Well, when we come to that struggle, it's not an easy struggle, it's littered with the bodies and the blood of countless numbers of Palestinians, of women and children amongst them, of an ethnic cleansing uh, project that goes back to 1947-1948 and continues to this day. So again, if we fail to make the proper assessment of Zionism, as I found and I, I've interacted with a lot of politicians around the world and a, a lot who are sympathetic to Palestinians, people in government and in fact in my own, that when they don't understand this, they fall for this um, this approach which comes out of Annapolis, which comes out of allowing the quartet instead of the people themselves to develop their own struggle and their own solution. And they believe in the end they caught up with having to be uh, balanced in terms of, of Israel and the Palestinians. The question of how far this is taking Zionism is an absolute scandal. But it shouldn't be surprising because when you analyze in history any doctrine based on race and which gives those who have that and run that project uh, the justification to then in the end do anything, the ends justifying the means. And we've seen from 47, 48, through 56, through 67, through the first, second intifada, through the onslaught of Lebanon in 2006, 1500 mainly civilians killed, lots of women and children. And then we see this horrendous onslaught on Gaza. Um, with absolutely no 
semblance of, of any form of humanity for the people concerned. So that Gerald Kaufman happens to be a Labour, a Labour member of Parliament in Britain, actually rather right wing. And uh, I can remember I was in Britain in the period of 68 and so on. He was Harold Wilson's press officer and he would attack the demonstrators on the Vietnam issue, you know, left, right, centre. He himself has classified himself as a friend of Israel's and has been going there every year for Yonks. He made a comment the other day <coughs> about the spokesperson, some major, a woman of the Israel Defense Force who tossed aside the question of non-combatants being killed and without any, any emotion said, well, this is the kind of thing that happens in war. But actually, we Israelis, our defense force is the most compassionate and humane in the world. He said this woman talks exactly like a Nazi. Okay, so we're not saying it's a Nazi state. But you see, there are measures that they use, and there's a mindset which makes us, again, it reminds us of what happens to human beings when they allow themselves this form of self-righteousness. And for me, one of the most revealing statements that I've come across from the annals of Israeli history was made in 1948 by the, the first Minister of Agriculture of Israel, Aharon Sizzling, who after the, um, the Da'ir Yassin massacre uh, was revealed, in which 240 men, women and children were just butchered by the Irgun, the terrorist group at the time, and the Stern Gang. He said, now we too have behaved like Nazis and my whole being is shaken. This is the nature of, of what we're facing. So that when you look at the obscenity of the weaponry used on Gaza, and what was used in the Lebanon, where white phosphorus bombs were first noted. Now with Israel's arsenal, it's not just the cluster bombs, it's the uranium-tipped shells, the flechettes they call them, which explode like cluster bombs of the Americans, but they throw out hundreds of thousands of sharp darts and they've got other forms of weaponry like this which hurl out razor discs. Um, what has happened in Gaza is an experiment. They're putting into practice the latest weaponry. They're testing it out. The Palestinians are being used treated as guinea pigs for the international arms industry and thereby hangs a tail. So it's not just Israel and it's not just us sitting here, people of Vancouver, British Columbia or across this great land. It's not just to help the Palestinians, which is a moral duty anyway in terms of solidarity. But it's actually about the future of your own children and grandchildren. Because when the international arms industry, largely driven, as you well know, by the United States, with Canada very closely interlinked, uh, with the Brits and the French and the Germans and the Chinese and the Russians and so on. But the development of an arsenal of weaponry, friends, that is not an arsenal of weaponry against ordinary soldiers with their battle armor and uh, all their devices and ability to defend themselves. White phosphorus bombs are banned from use 
against military personnel. So that lady that Kaufman was referring to, like the other spokespersons, she was saying, they were caught out, they had to change tack, the IDF spokespersons, that uh, we don't use anything that's not permitted. It was a lie. Because white phosphorus can only be used to help your troops on the battlefield when they are cornered. And you need to put down a very thick cloud of smoke. It's not to be used against the attacking force who are attacking your personnel. It's for the smoke screen. Because it is the most savage way of inflicting harm and death on people. Colin Green is one of the top surgeons in Britain who belongs to Physicians for Human Rights and links in with Israeli Physicians for Human Rights. I've had long discussion with him on my way here. He's a marvelous man and incidentally pays tremendous tribute to those Jews within Israel and those such as the Israeli physicians for, 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 for human rights amongst whom are Palestinian physicians within Israel itself, Muhammad. And he was telling me how people, the kids, women, whoever, <coughs> they hit with the white phosphorus and it's excruciating, but you think you've just been burnt on the surface. And initially, they send people back home after applying some surface dressing, only to, to be called two, three days later by the family to say that that kid, that person is in the most dreadful agony and um, the whole body is going black. Because what the phosphorus does is it melts through your body and gets right inside and it will eat you up from inside. And he said to me, Ronnie, when the surgeons cut the body open and the oxygen, the air, gets to the white phosphorus that's inside, it suddenly flares up and he's seen surgeons whose hands have been burnt as well as, of course, the poor victim. Now, what manner of people will use this kind of weaponry against other human beings? And this is where I, I'm optimistic in the end about human being and human nature, but we've seen from apartheid and racism in South Africa how decent human beings can uh, be so bombarded from birth through the whole socialization process in their homes and in their schools and in the military that in the end they will dance when they hear about the hundreds who are perishing which is what's been happening in Israel if like Mordechai you get into the net and you link in with the Palestinian electronic intifada, with those Israelis who are constantly Jeff Hel Jack Halpin and, and all these other wonderful people, exposing what is going on. So your minister here, Jason Kenney, and their ilk, they are not helping Jewish people. They are actually operating in a detrimental way. And this is why I believe that Zionism is the worst enemy of the Jewish people. Like many of those who came before me and, and Mordechai, who perhaps we both uh, had the privilege of at least learning a little bit about. <coughs> I'm coming to the end now. So my voice seems to have at least lasted this long. Um, and 
I just wanted to end, and I think I'll stand for this because it's five minutes, <laughs> <coughs> and I won't collapse for five minutes. So, um, but where does this all lead us? I've been emphasizing how important it is to understand this conflict and the problem and its causes and its threat to all of us in this world and in a world that with this economic meltdown, with the attacks on so many distant lands led by the coalition of the United States, Britain or whoever, sucking in so many palm trees, that in a sense there's a world war taking place which is going to be visited back on all of us. So again I want to reiterate that solidarity isn't just, it's not charity. Solidarity in the end is also about yourself and your worth as a human being. The South African experience through the anti-apartheid movement showed us the enormous extent of the role that solidarity played in many respects. The solidarity shows the people who are struggling, those in the prisons and so on, that the world is not ignoring them, that people stand with them. And of course the actions, the solidarity actions that uh, we had, rather similar to what's just happened today um, in Malmo, many occasions. I remember how New Zealand, not unlike Canada or Australia, right, those dominions, with the same type of background and history and mindset, not particularly revolutionary. And I saw a film the other day. It was a sports film, South Africa. Uh, we are a bit crazy about the weird game called rugby. Canadians are trying to learn it a bit. <laughs> but it showed the history of the South Africans, the Springbok uh, players, throughout like a hundred years. And there was the sequence of them in New Zealand, 1966. And everywhere they went, the red carpet was rolled out. They were being fated like absolute royalty. And it's a small country, you know, with small towns. And everywhere they stopped, whether in their buses or in the trains, the whole house, Uncle Tom Cobley and all, were there to greet them and cheer them. Virtually 12 years later, there was the next tour of New Zealand and the South African rugby players had no place to hide. They were running for, not dear life, it wasn't violent, but in terms of the mobilization, it had totally changed the New Zealand mindset. Uh, people came to those matches and there was quite a lot of partisanship because there will be rugby players, and there will be academics, and there will be trade ministers who will tell you, don't mix sport and academia and trade with politics. We are undermining ourselves. And I'll tell you that. So there are a lot of people getting rather heated because of the growing number of, of the New Zealand populace that would have nothing of it and stopped that tour in its tracks. Now that was something like 12, 15 years, I can't remember exactly. The anti-apartheid movement started off in 1959 in Britain out of a boycott in South Africa. Um, the ANC in South Africa called for an internal boycott against our potato farmers who were receiving uh, black labor out of the prisons. And many of the people, unfortunates, who were having to work as slave labor on their farms uh, never saw the next day and were buried with the potatoes there. 
and this came out, came to light. So we pulled the internal boycott against potato products, uh, fish and chips and uh, crisps and things like that. And then we had that idea, the leaders had this idea of going abroad, Britain being the main trading partner, and set up the anti-apartheid movement with the boycott issue. And it took 30 years before it was at its heart. It wasn't easy. Those of us who did solidarity work as well as our clandestine activities somehow uh, elsewhere, but when we were in London, we would be sent around Britain. And I can remember so many occasions. Uh, you know, there's nothing as bad as the, the English weather. It's, it's the farthest going uh, because it's always cold and wet through. So you get on your train and you go up to Manchester or Edinburgh or whatever, and someone would meet you at the station and you'd trudge around for several miles to come to some godforsaken place. And there would be 12 people waiting for you. We never ever showed any disappointment. We never showed the disappointment. You don't show the disappointment. And you know, you develop a mindset you develop a mindset, I mean, even if there were three or four, that, okay, don't know what happened with the way you guys organised, <laughs> but forget that, let's go and sit down at the pub or somewhere, <laughs> since it's just half a dozen of us, and let's chat this through over a beer or two. So, it's very hard work, and it's uphill slog, but it's very rewarding, and you get the critical mass being built up which we had right across the board in terms of the academic, the sporting, the cultural, the trade, uh, and so on. The orange, outspan orange, or Cape grapes, were ideal as clear-cut symbols of apartheid. And you know, th this is the aspect of strategizing. Um, there were very significant turning points. The sporting run, exactly like what's happened at Belma, turning points. Uh, Kodak workers in the States forced the divestment of Kodak from America, for, sorry, from South Africa. And very late in the day, but it was very significant, anti apartheid people started buying shares in Barclays Bank and going to the shareholders meeting and then attacking the policy. Uh, Barclays Bank proved out. They never said it was for that reason. It wasn't politics, but you know, just looking at the business aspect, I think it's, it's, it's time for us to go and invest somewhere else. But I, I really want to um, encourage everybody to build this movement here in Canada on the scale that you Canadians helped build the anti apartheid movement and the network and link right across the world. Now it wasn't the boycott on its own that led to the demise of apartheid. Otherwise we'd tell all the Palestinians, come out from home and help us build the boycott. It's an integrated struggle and a multi-pronged strategy. And for what it's worth, in, in our situation, we had what we call four pillars of struggle. And uh, we always discuss this, the Palestinians are very keen, and even Hamas, by the way, has wanted to know from us how did we get the change in South Africa. But um, the four pillars of struggle were essentially for us, the leading one was the organization of our people, mass political struggle, reinforced by underground struggle, people who were getting the leaflets out and, and radio broadcasts and plugging into the unions and uh, the, the youth and the women and the, 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 the uh, faith groups, giving them guidance, uh, and armed action. And with the armed action, we endeavoured, as far as possible, not to attack um, indiscriminate attacks on, on civilians. Uh, and then, fourth, key to this is the international solidarity movement. The Vietnamese had similar approach. In fact, we learned a lot from them. With the Vietnamese, given that they had uh, liberated territory in North Vietnam. For them, the primary aspect was the military. 
because we had uh, certain weaknesses in that regard, including our terrain. We correctly, and I, I would say it should be the case, unless you're actually at war, as, as was the case with the Vietnamese, that um, the, the focus on the mass political struggles, when you have 150,000 Palestinians living within Israel in the north, in the Galilee, demonstrating, marching in the streets against the butchery in Gaza. And this is that people who had hung on from 48, when 150,000 of them, and mainly young people, just like the young people, Mordechai's generation here, yeah. Um, Mohammed's generation. <laughs> Mordechai and myself, we still We're part of that. We're okay. The emergence of the youth of Palestine is very, very significant. They are incredibly impressive, the men and women, the young people. And when you see this demonstration on that scale within Israel, when you see with that 500 Jews marching with those people, when you see women in Toronto, Jewish women, staging a sit-in in the Israeli mission, when you see what's happened in the tennis match today, when you see the dock workers of Durban refusing to offload cargo, Israeli cargo from a ship flying a flag of convenience, then, Mordechai, you've said it. It's a cusp. It's a turning point. We're getting to the stage now where a huge movement is taking shape internationally and is going to be of incalculable support to the Palestinian people in their just, legitimate cause. And it is a cause that's going to help to liberate as the liberation of South Africa liberated both black and white, it's a cause that will liberate Muslim, Christian, and Jew in Palestine, Israel. So please carry on. Thank you.